And welcome to our digital discussion, a uh, special Tuesday night presentation. Although you're, you're watching whenever you're watching as well, uh, as this is saved on our Facebook and YouTube channels as well. Uh, my name is John Harry. So happy that you're with us tonight for our feature presentation of Brew City Black Ball, uh, the untold story of black baseball in Milwaukee with Ken Bartelt. Um, and we will get to that in just a second. A few things to mention uh, while everybody's getting settled in tonight for uh, what looks to be an exciting conversation. We do have our summer tour series going on right now with uh, the Milwaukee History Kayak Tours, partnering with the Milwaukee Kayak Company and our archivist, Steve Schopper. Uh, they go all up the three rivers of Milwaukee uh, on various uh, days and evenings, and uh, it's it's a ton of fun. So if you're looking for an excuse to get out, learn some history, and get on the water, that's the chance to do it. Uh, you can go to milwaukeehistory.net for info on that, as well as our Milwaukee History Bike Tours, partnering with Bubbler, Bubbler, excuse me, Bubbler Bikes, Try saying that again uh, on that. So if you don't have a bike to use, uh, you can get a special deal on your bubbler bike uh, for the Milwaukee History Bike Tours. Again, uh, dates and ticket info at milwaukeehistory.net on that. Uh, as far as programs go, we do have another program coming up next month on August 19th with author Jennifer Billock uh, exploring the classic restaurants of Milwaukee. So uh, make, sure, uh, make sure you eat something before that one because you'll probably be pretty hungry by the end of it. And uh, another announcement, too, is that our annual awards dinner is coming up on September 9th. If you're on our email list, you'll be getting an email about that uh, this week. Um, and if you're not, uh, you should get on our email list. Uh, so go to MilwaukeeHistory.net for that. Uh, but it's our chance to honor those who have made a significant contribution over the last year um, and their lifetimes um, in Milwaukee. But tonight we are talking baseball. So we got our uh, uh, MCHS employee, also PhD student at UWM, Ken, Ken Bartelt, uh, going to talk about uh, Bruce City, Black Ball, and Ken, it's all you. Who? You there, Ken? I'm good. Yep, I'm good. Oh, yeah. I thought I thought I was going to be on screen to introduce myself, but okay. Here we go. Oh, we're, there we, there go. we go. All right. You, you are on screen. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I wasn't sure if you could see me. If okay. you have any questions for Ken, just uh, we'll get to them at the end, but you can put them in the comments throughout. So, Ken, uh, have a ball. I will. Thank you, John. I love the baseball puns. Um, hi, I'm Ken Bartelt. I'm a PhD student at UW Milwaukee, um, and I'm I focus on the history of race in America, and I like to do that through the lens of sports history. Um, I wrote my thesis on the Negro Leagues in Milwaukee, and this presentation is derived from that. It's called Brew City Black Ball: The Untold Story of Black Baseball in Milwaukee. Um, now, my thesis was titled. Brew City Black Ball Milwaukee as Microcosm of the Early 20th Century Black Baseball Experience. Um, but this presentation is going to take more of a Milwaukee focus. Um, and if you are interested in reading that, um, I do have the link there and you can find it on ProQuest. Um, that's if you want to read the full 135 page document. But if you want something a little shorter and sweeter, uh, it was featured in the spring 2021 edition of uh, Milwaukee County History. That's the short little magazine newsletter that the society um, sends to its members. You could also buy a copy for like $3 at the society. So if you want to read a much shorter version of it, it's uh, available there. Um, so I just want to start with uh, understanding that Milwaukee has always been a baseball town. Um, it hasn't always been a major league city, but Milwaukee has certainly always been um, a baseball city. And so on the left here, you have one of my favorite photos. This is actually the background of my computer, um, is this crowd outside Borchard Field. Um, old Borchard Field was on 8th and Chambers, roughly, um, from 1909. Uh, it's got nothing on the Deer District today that we've been watching as the Milwaukee Bucks are playing in the NBA Finals, but still a pretty good crowd. Um, and then even uh, all the way up to 2018, um, you know, Brewers fans watching the Brewers in the playoffs. They've been pretty good the last few years. Um, but uh, this history of baseball in Milwaukee has always tended to be focused on those major league teams, um, whether it be the Milwaukee Braves, who arrived in Milwaukee in 1953 from Boston and then left the city for Atlanta in 1965, or the Milwaukee Brewers, who have been playing in Milwaukee since 1970. Um, the, the attention has always kind of been on these narratives. Um, 
But a lot of uh, scholars recently have done a really great job to uncover, you know, the, the whole breadth of Milwaukee's baseball past. And that includes teams like, you know, the American Association Milwaukee Brewers or the minor league Milwaukee Brewers. Um, also, uh, semi-pro teams like the Kajushko Reds, which were, you know, often representative of, uh, of ethnic neighborhoods or ethnic communities. Um, you also had parochial uh, league teams like the you know St. Cyril baseball team here. Um, and then there was even the Milwaukee Chicks um, of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Um, actually, Milwaukee's first uh, major baseball championship was won by the Chicks. Uh, and I believe MCHS did a presentation on them not too long ago. Um, but there's one team that has always kind of um, been mired in obscurity. Uh, Every year for probably the last decade, the Brewers have been wearing these Negro League throwback uniforms for a team called the Milwaukee Bears. But uh, no matter where I would look, I wouldn't be able to find much concrete detail as to who played on this team, uh, how they did. There really wasn't a lot out there on them. Um, but here are kind of the uniforms they wear. Uh, on the left, that's actually Craig Council, the current manager of the Brewers when he was a player wearing what they believed the Bears uniforms might have looked like, but then actually they discovered an old photograph um, and that made up the photo on the right, the uniforms in the photo of the right. And you're gonna see that photograph um, throughout this presentation. Um, so I kind of set out wanting to understand who the Milwaukee Bears were and why don't we know their story? And uh, so I started with, I have a newspapers.com subscription, um, allowing me to kind of look through all kinds of newspapers all over the country. Uh, it's term searchable. And I also have my uh, Milwaukee Public Library card, and I was able to go and see what they had there. And between the two, I was able to find over 400 newspaper clippings related to both the Bears, but also another team called the McCoy Nolan Giants that I'm gonna talk about today as well. Um, a black professional team that traveled out of Milwaukee during the 1920s. Um, so before we can get into that, uh, we need to kind of lay a groundwork of black baseball before the Negro Leagues. And I promise this is my only boring slide with facts and dates and things like that. Um, so, it needs to be understood that uh, baseball, it evolved from uh, kind of colonial bat and ball games that were likely of English origin. Um, and they were being played uh, throughout the original 13 colonies. Um, but in 1845, the New York Knickerbocker Club was formed. And that kind of, the game that they played was kind of established as the precursor to what we know as modern baseball. And it began in the, in the New York area. Um, and so pretty quickly, uh, African Americans were playing the game as well. Um, you both had um, enslaved and free black people playing baseball. And uh, we know this because during the New Deal, the Federal Writers Project, which was a program um, where the federal government was funding um, you know, historians and writers and people in the humanities, one of the projects they undertook was interviewing people who had been enslaved during slavery. And um, in many of these interviews, there were uh, you know, formerly enslaved um, people talking about playing baseball on plantations and things like that. So, um, you know, baseball had always been part of black identity. And also um, in a lot of free blacks in the North, particularly in Philadelphia, um, where the Pythians played, I'll talk more about them in a second. They were organizing their own clubs and leagues pretty early on as well. Um, so in 1859, you had the first recorded game between two organized all black clubs. Um, and the key word here is recorded. This is the earliest one we have record of. Um, and that was between a team called the Unknowns of Weeksville and the Henson Baseball Club of Jamaica. Jamaica being the neighborhood of New York, not um, Jamaica, the island. <laughs> uh, and then... Um, so teams like that had been playing and it was a very formal game. You would write like a letter to the team that you were gonna challenge and they would have to accept your challenge. And that it was all a lot of pomp and circumstance involved with it. 
Um, and in 1867, this organization called the National Association of Baseball Players, which was kind of the first organized league, um, they established the first formal color line. And, you know, there had been some black players who played on some of these teams or tried to join clubs that were in, in the National Association of Baseball Players. But they kind of came out in 1867 and they, they made a decree um, that they would not allow people of color to play in their league. Um, and this is the official statement that the representatives of the NABBP put out. They said, quote, if colored clubs were admitted, there would be in all probability some division of feeling, whereas by excluding them, no injury could result to anyone. So very clearly, they don't care about the opinions or feelings of people of color because they're coming right out and saying, well, uh, nobody would be upset if we didn't allow black people to play. But if we did, we would probably ruffle some feathers. Um, so they just decided that they didn't want to. Uh, allow them in the league. And this was really keeping in line with a larger trend in the country after the Civil War um, as we move into what's known as the Jim Crow period. Um, so earliest uh, organization, the NABBP, kind of adopted Jim Crow from the outset. Um, and then in 1869, there's the first recorded game between an all-Black club and an all-white club. And that was between the Pythians of Philadelphia um, and a white club known as the Olympics. Um, the Olympics won that game, but then a week later, the Pythians beat another white team and they became the first all black team to score a victory against an all white club. Um, then uh, after the NABBP had kind of dissolved. In 1871, baseball became more professionalized. There had been a movement towards paying players uh, because that way you could have a more talented team. And then you could, if you built a ballpark, which was kind of the movement around the country, uh, you could charge fans admission to come and watch your superior team. So in order to have a superior team that fans would be willing to pay money to see, uh, players started getting salaries and things like that. So the National Association of Professional Baseball Players was founded in 1871, and they had what was known as a gentleman's agreement that they would not sign any black players. That means they didn't need to write it into their rules. It was just like an understood thing between all the club owners that they would not sign a black player. Um, but the earliest color line here in professional baseball was uh, had a lot more holes in it than the one that would appear in the 20th century. Um, in 1878, a man named John W. Bud Fowler, he became the first black player to appear in a white professional league. Um, he played in a minor league, though. It wasn't until 1884 that you had Moses Fleetwood Walker to become the first black player to appear in a white major league. Um, <clears throat> so there had been, you know, Clearly, there are black players who are playing in white leagues, even with this gentleman's agreement. Um, it was very rare, but it did it did happen. Um, and historians have actually estimated that between 33 and 60 black players played in white leagues before 1900. Uh, so Jackie Robinson certainly didn't. Uh, he wasn't the first black player to play in the major leagues. He was the first after the color line was drawn. Um, then in. 1885, black professional baseball took a huge step forward with the formation of the original Cuban Giants. And this is the first all professional black team. So they're kind of like black baseball's version of the Cincinnati Red Stockings, which was formed in 1869, uh, where all the players were salaried. Um, and they developed this, uh, what was known as the booking system, where they would, you know, book games. They weren't part of a league. They would book games with individual teams, both other black teams, but also white semi-pro teams and things like that. Um, and that would allow them to kind of build a schedule and they would travel the country. Um, now, in 1887 is when you really get to see a like a, a rigiding of the uh, of the color line. It becomes more entrenched. Um, there were multiple incidences that it took that took place throughout the major leagues that season. Um, there was a player on the Syracuse Stars named Douglas Crothers who he refused to sit in the team picture because he had a black teammate. 
Um, and then when his managers kind of scolded him or reprimanded him for that, the Crothers actually punched his manager. Um, so he was suspended, but then they shortened his suspension. Also, the uh, St. Louis club, there was a St. Louis club that they wrote a formal letter to uh, Chris Vondere, their owner, saying that they would not play against a team with a black player, but they would gladly play against any white team. And they refu- They kind of boycotted. They said they were going to sit out until they were scheduled to play a white team. Um, so what happens then is the International League, um, which was considered a major league at the time, they established baseball's first written color line where it was written into their rules that they would not allow black players on any teams. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of by, by the end of the 1890s, uh, there had, there were no more black players left in a white league. And from 1898 to 1946, when Jackie Robinson suits up for the, um, uh, minor league team in Montreal, um, that's when the color line becomes broken. Um, so then, the, you know, black baseball has to kind of evolve separately, like a lot of industries in America at this time, separately from um, the white organizations because of uh, Jim Crow segregation. Um, so in 1894, one of the huge developments in black professional baseball is the formation of the Page Fence Giants. And that was actually the brainchild of Bud Fowler, the same guy who was the first black player to play in a white league. And um, his idea was that they would travel the country. He would get an all black team to travel the country in their own private train car. Um, And then they would give little parades on bicycles around the city before every game to kind of like rally up support to come see the game. And uh, what they did is they secured sponsorship deals. So the, the team name, Page Fence Giants, uh, Page Fence was a company. It was a wire fence company in Michigan. And so um, by getting this white businessman, this um, uh, Page was his name, to sponsor their team, uh, they were able to fund their operations. They also had a sponsorship with Monarch Bicycles. That was the bicycle company that sponsored all their little bikes they rode around. Uh, and that kind of became the model for a lot of the really successful black clubs going into the 20th century. And even one of the Milwaukee clubs we're going to talk about, the McCoy Nolan Giants, where you have a white businessman sponsoring a black team. Um, and the key part is having their own private mode of transportation uh, that they would be able to sleep in and things like that, because it was very perilous to be traveling through Jim Crow America at this time. You weren't sure where you were going to be able to stay or if you would uh, be permitted to stay anywhere. So you had to have your own sleeper car. Um, now, uh, in 1920, things finally kind of reached their apex with the formation of the Negro National League. And Rube Foster is kind of the the big figure in that. And uh, this is when the formal Negro Leagues really become kind of solvent, um, is in 1920. So let's get into the Milwaukee story then. Um, Now, there really hadn't been an attempt at a uh, Milwaukee-based Black professional team until 1922. Um, and that's when a team known as the Cream City Giants, um, arrived from, uh, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but they actually came here from Canada. Um, and this man here, Lieutenant Samuel Simon Gordon or SS Gordon, uh, he was a player, uh, for the Chicago American Giants, which was Rube Foster's team. He, he was really close with Rube Foster, Um, And he was kind of the, he was the coach and manager of this team. And as you can see in that newspaper clipping on the left, uh, the Giants, they held the right to Athletic Park, which is also, it also became known as Portrait Field. It's the same ballpark though. Um, And they had that right every Sunday that the minor league brewers were on the road and that they were scheduled to meet um, teams in the Midwest Uh, and then real important is the last sentence in that uh, clipping there it's this idea that if the venture was successful, Milwaukee was going to get a team in the Negro leagues in 1923. So there's already this stipulation there that if this, this uh, cream city giants team could play well, uh, Milwaukee would be given a Negro league club the following season. Um, Pretty quickly within their first two weeks of playing, 
this Cream City Giants Club came under a new owner. Um, and that's a guy by the name of John McCoy. You could see that in the newspaper clipping on the right there. And John McCoy was the owner of the McCoy Nolan Heater and Supply Company, which is like a plumbing supply company that was incorporated in Milwaukee in 1910. And um, McCoy, uh, he had a lot of connections to baseball in the city. Um, they were big sponsors of the minor league Milwaukee Brewers. They took out ads in the newspapers, like throwing their support behind the Brewers uh, much like we see today with someone like David Gruber, right? Uh, you know, before all the Brewers and Bucks games. Um, so this guy, uh, he was well connected with the Brewers. That probably explains how he was able to access Athletic Park because the Brewers were the owners of Athletic Park. Um, and then uh, he also had connections with um, semi-pro baseball in the city. His company had their own semi-pro baseball team, the McCoy Nolan Supply Company team. Um, and they actually won the city tournament in 1919. Um, and that with that team, he had built a relationship with Rube Foster down in Chicago. And one of the first teams that Rube Foster played with his American Giants in Milwaukee was McCoy Nolan's semi-pro team. Um, so he had, he knew the biggest player in black baseball, which is Rube Foster. Um, so, and he had connections to the Brewers. So he kind of capitalizes on these connections. He buys this cream city giants team and he changes their name to the McCoy Nolan giants, uh, much like the page fence giants, um, that I just talked about who were formed in 1894. Now I was I was interesting interested to find that the um, Cream City team actually came from Calgary, Canada. Um, I found a number of newspaper clippings that mentioned uh, how this McCoy Nolan Club had traveled out of Calgary the year prior, um, and you know this. Uh, to corroborate that, I compared lineups from the two teams, and I found a bunch of newspaper clippings of the Calgary team up in Canada, Canadian newspapers, um, and then I also found some, in, you know, they traveled down to Wisconsin, so like I have the Sheboygan Press here, and uh, actually there were four players that were featured in both lineups, so um you know, their names were uh, Myers. He was a first baseman, uh, a third baseman named Reed, a catcher named Gray, and a pitcher and occasional first baseman named Walters. And they were both playing in games for each of those teams. Um, and then also uh, with S.S. Gordon being in charge, he was real close with Rube Foster. And they actually worked out with the Rube Foster's American Giants in the offseason. They practiced together kind of like in spring training. Um, so my theory here is, and you can kind of see where this is, how this is unfolding is Rube Foster was looking to test out Milwaukee as a potential market for a Negro league club. And he has, uh, Gordon take his Calgary team that he had established, move them to Milwaukee. Um, and then kind of that way he was nice and close, you know, just about 90 miles South in Chicago, uh, where he could easily play this Milwaukee team. He can keep an eye on the business. And if Milwaukee proved to be a successful market, you know, he could put a team there for his new league. Um, and one thing to point out is this uh, Calgary, they were actually known as the Calgary Black Sox, but uh, the term Giants kind of becomes a catch-all term for all Black teams. Uh, that's because most of the early successful black teams were called the Giants. You had the Cuban Giants and the Page Fence Giants. So a lot of these uh, black teams, they wanted to kind of, uh, you know, draw a, a connection or a line to the teams that came before them. Um, and so this team was was really very successful. Uh, on, in the August 3rd, 1921 edition of the Calgary Herald, they wrote the following about the team. They said the Giants are a team comprising a galaxy of stars who are denied playing in the major leagues through a ruling which has been in vogue since organized ball started. But the ability of these players is recognized by those who know the game from its many angles. So it's interesting, you write right here in Calgary in 1921, this right white newspaper 
uh, is saying that these players are good enough to play in the major leagues. Um, they're just barred by the color line. Uh, and anyone who knows baseball would would be able to recognize that. Um, so you already have this, by the 1920s, this kind of chipping away at the, the validity of the color line. Um, now, this was a Canadian newspaper, so that, that could have something to do with it as well. Um, now, they played their home games, these McCoy Nolan Giants at Athletic Park. Like I said, there's a nice aerial view of it there. Now the highway goes through it. Um, there's a little historical marker down by the highway, though. Um, and uh, so early on in the season, they pretty much played all their games at Athletic Park. And one of the real interesting moments in Milwaukee baseball history that they were part of is the first ever what they call twilight game um, to ever be played at Athletic Park. And so this isn't quite a night game because the you know lights hadn't been brought into play yet. That doesn't happen until the Great Depression. Uh, and that actually was a black baseball innovation. Lights, uh, the Kansas City Monarchs were the first to use lights consistently. Um, but this would have been like in the early evening hours, you'd be playing a game. Um, and this is designed for people to get off of work and be able to watch a game, right? Before this, uh, you know, most baseball games would be played in the middle of the day. So if you were a worker or a laborer, like much of the population was, um, you wouldn't be able to watch that. Um, so if you want to get more paying customers, you want to start your games a little later um, during the weekdays, especially. So uh, as you can see, um, they took part on uh, June 20th, 1922 in the first Twilight game. They played a semi-pro team in Milwaukee called Walter Lang's Red Sox. Um, more than 1,000 fans showed up to watch that game. Um, and they must have had a hard time seeing because it ended in a 0-0 tie. So the they might have been a little too late. The visibility might have been low. The hitters were having a hard time. Uh, there were only seven combined hits between the two teams, it looks like, and no runs. Um, but two days later, uh, the McCoy Nolans won the rematch between the two clubs, uh, 13 to six. So they didn't have any problems hitting then. And that was also a twilight game. Um, another really interesting moment in this first season for the McCoy Nolan Giants is their involvement in a Labor Day tournament that was organized between the McCoy Nolan Gi Giants and the Cream City Semi-Pro League. So the Cream City League was like the semi-professional municipal league. And they organized this fundraiser tournament with the McCoy Nolan Giants. So you have these all white teams in this league organizing a tournament with an all black team where starting on Labor Day and then continuing every day after for two weeks, one of the teams in the Cream City League would play a double header against the McCoy Nolan Giants at Athletic Park. And all the funds from that, um, or the majority of the funds, would go towards paying the uh, expenses of the Cream City League's representative in the national semi-pro championships. So um, what you have here is this example of interracial cooperation um, at, the, at the lower levels of baseball, where the, the color line kind of blurs. Um, the color line was very rigid at the major league level and in what we call organized baseball, but in the semi-pros and, and, um, and independent leagues, uh, the color line was certainly not as rigid. And this tournament is an example of that. And really uh, historians kind of describe what we call a symbiotic relationship between uh, the you know, black professional teams and the white semi-pro teams because games between all black clubs and white semi-pro clubs were very lucrative. Um, you know, and so they scheduled a lot of games with each other and uh, without each other, you know, those business ventures um, wouldn't have been nearly as successful as they were. Um, so in addition to uh, playing against white semi-pro clubs at Athletic Park. They also hosted some of the top teams in the Negro Leagues. Um, so as you can see here in this um, J Milwaukee Sentinel from June 18th, 1922, uh, the McCoy Nolans played against Rube Foster's own club, the uh, Chicago American Giants, um, arguably the, uh, the most dominant team of the early 1920s. And they played them pretty tough. They, uh, 
they lost eight to seven and they actually mounted a late inning, a ninth inning rally that fell just short. The tying run was stranded in scoring position. Um, and then uh, later on that season, the very next week, they actually defeated the uh, Cuban Stars, another Negro National League team, um, and they actually beat them nine to eight. So, uh, and you know that really showed that this McCoy Nolan team was talented enough to kind of play with the big boys in black professional baseball. Uh, this news clipping on the right, um, if you read it. It also mentions how uh, the Cuban stars were like a late fill-in because the originally scheduled game between the McCoy Nolans and a club called the Flambeau Indians uh, was canceled. Um, and that's, you know, this was something that happened in, um, in semi-pro baseball and in black professional baseball is uh, sometimes, you know, the s schedules, uh, teams wouldn't be able to make it or they would cancel last minute. Um, it was not nearly as consistent of a schedule as, say, the white major leagues were. Um, this was much more fluid. Um, and, you know, this also kind of shows that uh, Foster, being the, the booking agent for the Negro Leagues, um, he was willing to schedule a game last minute with one of his Negro National League teams to go play up in Milwaukee. So he was definitely taking an interest in this, this Milwaukee team. And largely because of that success against Negro League competition, but also because they pretty much dominated a lot of the teams in the in Wisconsin, the white semi-pro teams they played around along the state. Um, they uh, they got a Negro League team in Milwaukee for 1923, um, and that's going to be the Milwaukee Bears. Now, um, what's interesting, too, is when I started this project, I thought that these were two totally separate entities that, um, you know, maybe they were competitors, but they wouldn't have had anything to do with each other, really. But what my research actually found is that the McCoy Nolan Giants became the Milwaukee Bears. Um, and I know that for a couple reasons. Uh, one is we have at least five players appear on the rosters of both teams. Um uh, these I only threw a few examples of box scores up there. You can see a few names are similar, um, like Thompson appears in both. Uh, um, there's also a uh, Boggs is on both, Wilson. Um, but there's also a guy named Red, a guy named Walters, um, and also a man named Frank Duncan. He was the captain of the 1921 Calgary Black Sox. So that's that team that moved from Calgary to become the McCoy Nolan Giants. He played on the Milwaukee Bears. So there's a relationship there um, between these clubs. And also there are no records of the McCoy Nolan Giants playing in 1923. So you look through all the newspapers that reported on them in 1922 in their first season and then you look in all the newspapers that reported on them uh, after 1923. They don't; those same newspapers don't say anything about the McCoy Nolans during the 1923 season. So, um, you know, you, you add all that together, and uh, you get the McCoy Nolan Giants becoming the Milwaukee Bears, and that makes sense because Milwaukee certainly couldn't have supported two representative, you know, all black teams. Um, so. Who were the Milwaukee Bears, um, this team that has kind of uh, escaped real historical analysis up to this point? Um, well, they didn't have a very successful season. Um, their record their uh, record in Negro National League competition was only 15, 51, and 1, so they did not win very many games. Um, and they also play only played in Milwaukee for parts of four months before they were forced to leave for Toledo, Ohio, uh, just because they weren't drawing any fan support in the Cream City. Um, so it's really not – this is one of those Negro League um, stories of failure. And I think, you know, a lot of Negro League scholarship is very, you know, and rightly so, very, um, you know, romanticized. It's, you know, this – by all intents and purposes, the Negro Leagues are one of the first successful black businesses on a national scale. Um, you know, baseball was that. Uh, but because a lot of the hurdles that I'm going to talk about in a second, 
not all of this was a success story. Um, and Milwaukee is an example of uh, where the Negro Leagues were not a success story. Um, so it wasn't all bad, though. I mean, there are some uh, connections to significant figures and moments in Negro League history. They had some good seasons on, by some of their players, too, like Herman Roth, their catcher. He, he batted 274 and caught 44 games for them. Uh, Percy Wilson, who played on both the uh, McCoy Nolans and the Bears, he led the team in RBIs, doubles, triples, and on-base plus slugging percentage. Um, so he had a really good season. Um, but they're, the biggest things are the guys who were in charge of this team. And it starts with Pete Hill. Uh, he, they were, he was the on-field manager. And so Pete Hill, uh, he was actually inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006, largely for his work as a member of um, the Chicago American Giants with Rube Foster uh, in the early 1910s, before the Negro Leagues were even formed. You know, Foster still operated an independent black professional team. Um, and Hill was the captain of that team. Um so, you know, this guy is as decorated a player as any in Negro League history. And the fact that he was the manager of this team, um, you know, it really it's really a baseball story in Milwaukee that deserves to be told. The fact that a guy as great as Pete Hill was involved here. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at his Hall of Fame plaque, uh, it mentions that he was a player manager of the Detroit Stars and the Baltimore Black Sox. Uh, but it doesn't mention that he managed the Milwaukee Bears, um, which is, you know, that just shows how little baseball historians knew about the Milwaukee Bears, because this is at Cooperstown, New York, and they don't even have that information on his Hall of Fame plaque. But if you go through all the newspaper reporting and all the big black newspapers and even the local, you know, Milwaukee Journal and Milwaukee Sentinel, uh, John Preston Pete Hill is the manager of the Milwaukee Bears. Um also, uh, Dave Wyatt um, was in charge of the business side of the operation. Um, so Dave Wyatt is one of those figures in black baseball history that um, is probably overlooked. And um, he's responsible even for bringing Rube Foster to Chicago. So Dave Wyatt was a black sports writer. He wrote in some of the big uh, black newspapers in the country and uh, he also played himself early on in the, you know, the early 1900s. Um, but he's the one who went and he found Rube Foster pitching in Texas and he recruited him to come play in Chicago um, for the Leland Giants, which was a, you know, the team that Foster eventually kind of took over. Um, so had Wyatt not done that, the whole, you know, history of black baseball could have been radically different because, you know, it was being in Chicago that really gave Foster, um, you know, the basis from which to start his league. Uh, but Wyatt, he, he also drafted the first Negro National League constitution. So he literally wrote the rule book um, for the league. Uh, he also served as their first secretary and the publicity agent for the league in 1921. Um, the historian Jerry Strecker called Dave Wyatt the most important sports writer of the early Negro Leagues, and that without Wyatt, later black sports writers might have had nothing to write about. Um, so the fact that this guy was living in Milwaukee, he had a Milwaukee mailing address to solicit um, games with the Milwaukee Bears, uh, the fact that he was here, I mean, that's hugely significant. Um, but uh, another thing that uh, I think is is probably one of the biggest contributions that the Bears were part of is they played in one of the first ever Negro League games umpired by black men. So when the Negro Leagues were founded in 1920, they didn't have a staff of umpires. Um, it was kind of each up to each team to hire their own umpires. Um, unlike the major leagues today who have their own umpires. Um, and Foster made, you know, a practice. He mainly hired white men. It was all white umpires for the black league. And he got a lot of flack from about this in the black press, understandably. So they were questioning, uh, you know, Foster's status as a race man and whether or not the Negro leagues were really a race institution as they would call it, you know, 
Um, but in 1923, he finally gave in to this pressure and he hired his first um, you know, set of black umpires. And in their home opener uh, in Milwaukee, the Bears played in a game that was umpired by black men. Um, and, you know, this got rave reviews in the black press. Um, and this was a big deal for both uh, symbolic and practical purposes, because for one, symbolically, they were trying to show, you know, that this was, um, you know, this was a black league that, you know, black men, black people could run. They didn't need, you know, a white man policing the game, right? So the optics of that were always bad. But also there's like a practical purpose because these were jobs that could be going to the black community. Um, and that particularly former ball players. So if you were a retired baseball player, uh, now you had an opportunity to get employment as an umpire in the, you know, the Negro leagues or in the Negro minor leagues. Um, before 1923, that wasn't happening. And uh, the fact that the Bears were there, uh, they were there for their first home game in Milwaukee, but they also played at the first um, game umpired by black men in Chicago's Shoreling Park, where the American Giants played. Um, so, you know, in Shoreling Park, that is a hugely significant park in Negro League history, and uh, the Bears were there for it. Now, um, there are those connections to those great uh, figures and moments in Negro League history. But like I said, uh, this, the Milwaukee team didn't really work out. Um, and there are kind of two broad categories of reasons for that. Uh, the first is um, there are reasons common to Rube Foster's Negro National League. Um, and the other are reasons that were unique to Milwaukee. Um, so first, let's talk about the Negro Leagues and some of the challenges that they faced in general. Um, so there was really bad franchise instability from the beginning. Even after the first season uh, in 1920, there were clubs that were disbanding. Um, and over the 12 year existence of the first Negro National League, only Foster's own Chicago American Giants were members continuously. Um, so only one team survived all 12 years of this first Negro National League. Um, and there were also issues with um, uh, scheduling imbalances. And all of these schedule imbalances were kind of linked to the absence of ballpark ownership. And baseball historians call the absence of ballpark ownership the Achilles heel of black baseball. Um, you know, not being able to own your playing facilities uh, was a big issue because, um, you know, if you're relying on renting space from the established stadiums, right, building these stadiums was very expensive. Um, and you also had to have connections to city government. Um, in order to get them built, right? You can't just build a stadium, right? You have to get permits, you have to get uh, approval. Um, so it was really difficult for these um, kind of black baseball entrepreneurs to build their own ballparks, to be to uh, acquire the property that it required. Um, so they were relying on renting from white teams. And this was certainly the case with the Bears. They had to rent playing space at Athletic Park from the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, so if the minor league Brewers had a rain out, um, they would get precedent for rescheduling their game. So let's say it rained and the Brewers had to make up their game the next day, but you had a Negro League game scheduled at Athletic Park that day. Well, you would just bounce the Negro League game. You would say, sorry, um, this is our park. We get precedent. Um, so it was very difficult and there was a lot of insecurity in making a schedule. Um, and so because of this, a lot of these black baseball teams, um, they only played about a third of their games every year against league competition. So when we watch the, the Brewers today, um, we know they're going to play, well, other than last year, uh, 162 games. Um, and it's going to all be against major league competition, right? That is the major league baseball season. Um and that's the way it was, you know, back then, um, the white organized leagues, they played the same number of games every season. Um, everyone in the league played the same number of games, more or less. Um, now, that was definitely not the case with black baseball uh, because of these scheduling issues. 
So only about a third of the more than 200 games that the typical black team would play in a given year was against league competition. So they played most of their games against wet white semi-pro teams, um, against other independent black teams that weren't in the official Negro League. Um, and this means that uh, every team is playing a different number of games too. So it, it's really difficult to have like legitimate standings and a legitimate pennant race. Um, so for example, in 1923, the year that the Bears played, uh, all eight teams in the league um, played a different number of games. So the Kansas City Monarchs, they played as many as 90 games. The Toledo Tigers played as few as 26. And the Bears played around 67 Negro National League games. Um, so there's not a lot of legitimacy in uh, giving a title to the winner of a league where everybody's playing a different number of games, right? Uh, so that was definitely something that the Negro League struggled with. Um, but they also had uh, a lot of antagonism between the owners um, in the Negro Leagues. Uh, Foster had this reputation of being kind of an autocratic ruler of the Negro Leagues. He was in charge of all scheduling. He was in charge of all equipment distribution and purchasing. And he typically set prices that would allow him to line his pockets and things like that. Um, so Foster uh, was, a, was, you know, he was, a, he was not alone either. Many of the other owners were kind of looking out for themselves as, as well. And uh, so Michael Lomax, who's a, a historian of the Negro Leagues, um, he explains this by saying that, you know, white baseball achieved at uh, are, uh, they were able to achieve what he called the competitor partner model, which is where you're, you're in com competition with all the different teams in the league, but you're also partners, right, for the good of the league. Um, so you're competing on the field for the title, but you're also all trying to do what's best for the league as a whole. Um, he says that black baseball followed more of what he called a business alliance model, where each one of these black teams was almost its own business and they were in kind of a loose uh, alliance with each other where um, you might cancel a, an official Negro League game to play a more lucrative game against a white semi-pro team, right? If, uh, if all of a sudden the American Association Milwaukee Brewers said, hey, we want to play a game against the Milwaukee Bears, um, they would probably cancel their game against the other Negro League team to play that game that would promise to bring in more money. Um, so that was kind of uh, true throughout the Negro Leagues. Um, and all of these, though, um, you know, these are all kind of rooted in this absence of white privilege that the Negro Leagues had, right? Um, there are systemic barriers to the acquisition of property for African Americans, uh, largely tied to difficulties establishing generational wealth, um, there is little access to these established political networks within city governments that I've talked about. Um, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, to get thing, um, property to build a stadium. I've already hit on that, but there's also the difficulties of traveling in Jim Crow America. Um, you could not travel all over the country as a black person in this time, right? Um, you would not be allowed to take your all black team to certain cities and stay in certain places, um, also your clientele is more, uh, you're, you're more so targeting a black audience, right? And African Americans in this time, uh, did not on average have the disposable income. Uh, they did not have the leisure time to spend on baseball. So, um, you know, the white leagues, they had an easier time attracting fans because a lot of the fans were able to afford to go to the games you know, black teams had a uh, had a clientele that would have had a harder time going to games in the first place. And that was particularly difficult in a place like Milwaukee. Um, and so let's talk about that, the kind of cream city context here. Um, so while the McCoy Nolan Giants had a lot of success in 1922, a lot of that success was um, probably due to novelty, right? It was kind of a new thing, but also they spent a lot of time traveling outside of Milwaukee. They didn't play a consistent league schedule um, with home games at Milwaukee all year. Um, so if you're playing a league schedule, it's a totally different ball game in terms of trying to fund your operations. Uh, so Milwaukee has a relatively small black population in the 1920s. Um, in 1920, 
although it had grown by 127.4% from 1910 to 1920, it still was only 2,229 persons or just 0.4% of the city's total population. So less than half of a percent of Milwaukee was African-American at the time that the Bears were trying to play in Milwaukee. Um, and, you know, just by comparison, uh, a city like Chicago, where the American Giants uh, were one of the most successful franchises in the Negro Leagues, they had a black population by 1930, which was at 234,000, or just under 7% of the Windy City's entire population. Um, also, Detroit, um, they had uh, 120,000 black people living in the city by 1930, where Milwaukee only had 7,501. So, um, just the population numbers alone uh, did not bode well for a, a business that is reliant on black patronage. Um, and not to mention that, you know, in Milwaukee, there was a nearly non-existent black middle class. Um, racist hiring practices and union exclusion had kind of uh, restricted the majority of the black population to, you know, menial work. Um, where they wouldn't have had the discretionary income or leisure time, like I've talked about, to, you know, go to baseball games. Um, and, you know, this was Chicago by the 1920s was starting to develop more of a black middle class. Uh, and that really wasn't there in Milwaukee just yet. Um, now, Milwaukee, that would develop more as a late or second great migration city. So Milwaukee's black population didn't really start to get large until the 1950s. Um, and today it's about half the city's population is African-American. Um, so, uh, you know, had they tried to put a team in Milwaukee in the you know 19, late 1940s or 1950s, it might have been more successful. But by that time, Jackie Robinson had broken the color line and the Negro Leagues were struggling because black fans were starting to go to Major League Baseball games to watch the black players um, that were now playing in the white Major Leagues. Um, also, there was a lot of socioeconomic fragmentation within Milwaukee's black population. There was a big divide between kind of the old established black elite who have been in Milwaukee for a few generations and the kind of more uh, Southern recent migrants uh, during the Great Migration. Um, a lot of the newer migrants, they wanted, you know, black only institutions that would, you know, serve the black community. Whereas some of those older elites, they wanted to kind of, um, you know, keep the ties they had built um, by building connections with some of the white community. Um, and there was, you know, a big debate going on in 1923. Um, a great book, if you want to know more about the development of Milwaukee's black population, is uh, Black Milwaukee, The Making of an Industrial Proletariat um, by Joe William Trotter, Jr. I uh, relied on this book pretty heavily um, in working on my thesis just to have kind of the, the context of uh, Black Milwaukee's development. Um, and so what happens with the Bears is after four, roughly four months of trying to uh, draw fans and struggling to do so, but also losing on the field, that certainly didn't help. It's not like they were a winning team to go watch. Um, the league decides to shake things up in the middle of the season. Uh, so you can see this newspaper clipping on the right here from the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the biggest black newspapers in the country that covered the Negro Leagues. Um, and so what happens is the uh, there was a club in Toledo called the Toledo Tigers, and they were even worse than the Bears, if you can imagine that. Um, and so what they decided to do was just to have that Toledo club disband altogether. So that team dissolved. And then the team that was playing in Milwaukee, the Bears, they were going to move to Toledo and start playing their home games in Toledo as the Milwaukee Bears. Um, they were still the Milwaukee Bears, but they were playing in Toledo. Um, and the Toledo club ceased to exist. And then they were going to bring in the Cleveland Tate Stars, which was a team that had formerly been in the Negro Leagues, but disbanded and was now playing in the Negro Minor Leagues. They were going to bring them in and have Cleveland kind of take um, the place of Toledo. 
Uh, but that actually fell through, and they just finished the season with only seven teams in 1923. Cleveland didn't actually end up joining. Um, so Milwaukee, uh, its short life as a Negro League city was over uh, after only four months. So what, what finally happens um, is – Joe Rush, the owner of the Birmingham Black Barons, a team that played in the Negro Southern League. Uh, you might have heard of the Birmingham Black Barons because that's the same team that the all-time great Willie Mays played on later on before he made it to the major leagues. Uh, he played for the Black Barons. So uh, the Joe Rush, he purchased the Milwaukee franchise for $2,000 after the 1923 season so that his Black Barons could then join the Negro Leagues. Um, so they take Milwaukee's place the following season. Um, and then uh, that was not the end of Black baseball in Milwaukee, though. Um, right away in 1924, the McCoy-Nolan Giants start playing again. And this time they were under the control of a man named um, Charles Gooch or C.L. Gooch. Um, and as you can see on the left there, there's a solicitation. Um, that's actually in the Pittsburgh Courier um, asking them to reach out to C.L. Gooch um, at his Milwaukee address if they want to uh, schedule a game with the newly reformed McCoy Nolan Giants. And what happens is from 1924 to 1932, the McCoy Nolan Giants build one of the most successful international barnstorming storming operations in black baseball. They become one of the elite uh, black professional independent teams. They were not playing in the Negro Leagues, um, but they were having tremendous success traveling the country um, as what we call a barnstorming team. So that's a team that travels all over. They don't necessarily... Um, play a consistent home schedule, uh, but they were based out of Milwaukee. Um, and so uh, they played in Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, Mississippi, Florida, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and even Canada and Cuba. So that's they were international. I mean, they were going north and south of the border. Um, and um, they, they, I have newspaper clippings from newspapers in each of those states um, referencing this team. Uh, that photograph there is from the Pasadena Post. This was on the front page of their sports section. Um, in 1929, when the McCoy Nolans arrived um, to play a tournament in Pasadena, California. Um, and uh, they really rack up some impressive win-loss records um, during the second incarnation of the McCoy Nolan Giants. So in 1926, they won 72 games. They lost 14 so they had an 837 winning percentage in 1926. Um, in 1929, they did even better. They won 163 games with only 29 losses for a 849 winning percentage. Now, if you want to compare that to the all-time Major League Baseball record, which is the 1906 Chicago Cubs, right? Chicago Cubs have the all-time best winning percentage. Who would have known? Um, they were 116 and 36, which is a 763 winning percentage. Now, this is not a perfect comparison, though, because the Cubs in 1906 were playing every one of their games against major league competition. Um, the McCoy Nolans would play just about anybody and everybody who was willing to pay to play them. Um, so they played a lot of games against top Negro League teams, but they were also playing games against, um, you know, uh, just – for example, they played a game against the the Green Bay Press Gazette Newshounds, which was just the team of employees at the newspaper in Green Bay. Uh, so they played a game against them. They also played against the State Teachers College team in Wisconsin. So you know, college level competition. So um, the, you know, these win loss records for the McCoy Nolans, you got to take them kind of with a grain of salt. Um, they are incredibly impressive. Um, but you also got to read between the lines and see who they were playing against. Um, they also played multiple games against the famous House of David, uh, which was a 
uh, like a religious commune out of Benton Harbor, Michigan, uh, that had a baseball team. And they were famous for their scraggly look. They wore long hair and beards. Um, the historian Scott Simkus called them the most famous independent professional team in baseball in the 1920s and 30s. And the McCoy Nolans played them twice, at least twice. Uh, they lost to them once and they beat them once. Um, so they were playing against some of the top independent teams in the country. Uh, they themselves were one of the top independent teams in the country. And, um, you know, history has not really recognized them uh, to this point. Um, they traveled the country in a private bus, much like the Page Fence Giants did. Uh, their bus had room for 25 people and they employed a mechanic or driver uh, or, and driver. He was the driver and a mechanic. Uh, to drive them around, and there was room to sleep on this bus. So again, if you're traveling in Jim Crow America, they didn't have to worry so much in case they had nowhere to stop and stay. Um, and if you were paying attention in my list of states that they traveled to, many of those were in the South. So in the 1920s, this team from Milwaukee was traveling into the, the heart of the Jim Crow South to play baseball games. Um, and a lot of the games in the South had uh, segregated fan sections um, where they would have a small section for black fans to come in and watch the black teams play. Uh, but the, most of the stands were reserved for white fans um, and they would draw huge crowds in the South. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, the McCoy Nolans, they kind of fall victim to the Great Depression much like a lot of independent baseball teams did uh, in, in that era. Uh, there are no records of the team after 1932. Um, none of the newspapers that were reporting on them cover them at all. Uh, they just kind of disappear after 1932. Um, and that would make sense with you know the state of the country's economy at that time. Uh, MLB attendance went down something like 15% in that year. Uh, so even the major leagues were having attendance problems. Um, so these more grassroots operations uh, were struggling even harder because they didn't have the financial resources that the major leagues had. Um, and this symbiotic relationship between black baseball and the white semi-pros uh, was greatly damaged during the Great Depression as well, because when... Um, you know, if a white team stopped operating, uh, that means there was one less team for the McCoy Nolan Giants to try to schedule a game with. So, and vice versa, if the McCoy Nolan stopped operating, that was one less black traveling team that that white semi-pro team um, uh, would be able to schedule a game with. Now, um, I'll hit on this. This is one of the, the last things I'm gonna talk about before we conclude. In addition to their success on the playing field, the McCoy Nolan Giants also engaged in one of the most controversial practices in black baseball history, something known as clowning. Um, and clowning is essentially, you know, on field antics. They call it vaudevillian antics or um, I have the Harlem Globetrotters uh, poster there. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but that's not how you can kind of envision this, you know, picture the Harlem Globetrotters and the kind of things that they would do on the baseball diamond. Um, now, clowning was not unique to black baseball. There were white teams like the House of David. They had a shtick um, that would do things like this as well. But in black baseball, it was particularly important for these traveling teams um, and it often took a very racist tone and, um, as you can see, one of the, the first really successful all black clowning teams is the Ethiopian clowns, um, or you know, there were the, uh, the cannibal giants, the Zulu cannibal giants were another one. They would wear grass skirts and uh, tribal paint while they played. Um, and uh, this didn't really happen in uh, the Negro Leagues. The formal leagues wanted to distance themselves from this kind of behavior. So you, you didn't hear about clowning with the Milwaukee Bears, um, but a lot of the reports about the McCoy Nolan Giants talk about their comedic uh, qualities, their, their on-field antics. Um, I don't have any photographs of the McCoy Nolans themselves, but um, you know this, this was a pretty common practice. But um, you know, 
at the same time, this was a way to uh, increase visitorship uh, and increase how much money you were going to be taking home. And this really traces its roots back to the, the minstrel tradition in America, right? Uh, blackface minstrelsy, um, where it, initially white people donning blackface, but a lot of African Americans uh, performed blackface minstrelsy as well. Burt Williams is per perhaps the most famous. Um, and, you know, this is you're acting out these very harmful black stereotypes, um, but you're also providing for yourself and for your family and for, uh, you know, your, your, gaining a level of, of celebrity. So it's a very complicated psychology to get into. Um, but uh, what I think is important here is this was something that black baseball did when they were catering to a primarily white audience. And um, this was, if you look at a lot of the places the McCoy Nolans traveled, they were very small towns throughout the Midwest and the West that had almost all white populations. And, you know, um, one of their big selling points was kind of the novelty of blackness in an all white space. Um, this was a place, uh, if you went to go watch one of these traveling teams play, it may be one of the only times you were going to be exposed to an African American. Um, so white towns, the whole town would show up for some of these games. Um, and this is where clowning becomes really harmful because, in a lot of ways, they're they're reproducing those stereotypes uh, in an instance where it's one of the only times, you know, a white audience was was engaging with African-Americans. And if you know anything about popular culture in America in this time, uh, racist caricatures were pretty much everywhere in advertising and in film. And so it's not just on the baseball diamond. It's part of a larger a larger cultural trend. Um, so over here you have. Uh, um, you know, even the Indianapolis Clowns, a team that um, Hank Aaron eventually played for uh, before coming to Milwaukee, um, you know, they even adopted the name Clowns and would engage in clowning antics. On the left, you have King Tut and his giant glove that he would, you know, wear to get a laugh. Um, and in the middle, you have Oscar Charleston, who's one of the, uh, you know, arguably the greatest black baseball players of all time. Um, and that really shows the validity that this clowning had, you know, even the all time great players were associated with with clowning in some way. Um, and then you also had you know, a women played in the Negro League. So like Connie Morgan. And no, don't get me wrong. These women were very talented and many of them absolutely held their own. But the Negro Leagues were willing to allow women to play because, again, it was kind of a novelty. It was a way to sell tickets. Um, but uh, many women did play in the Negro Leagues. Um, so on the, on the right, I have the, uh, image. This is actually for Madison, the Dane County Coliseum. Uh, the Harlem Globetrotters actually have their origins in black baseball. Abe Saperstein, the founder of the Harlem Globetrotters, uh, he originally worked in black baseball. He owned black baseball teams who would, um, do these kind of clowning antics and things like that. And the Globetrotters are kind of an extension of that in a way. Um, so where the scholarship needs to go, um, I one thing that I struggled with with this project is uh, finding out specific details about who these players were. Right? These are to me these all came off as just names on a on a lineup card, and often I wouldn't even get their first name; it would just be their last name in these lineups. Um, so trying to track down who these people were, where did they work? You know, where were they from? You know, uh, that would be really great to find out, to, you know, put more of a human element to this. Um, also, black baseball at the grassroots level, not just in Milwaukee, but nationwide. I mean, a lot of the scholarship is focused on professional baseball. Um, but baseball is a big part of American culture outside of uh, professional teams and leagues. Um, so, for example, I've got the photo there. The Milwaukee Urban League had a baseball team. There's a team photo in 1930. Um, over here, uh, the Weir Steel Municipal AA champions um, in Milwaukee in 1938. Um, there are also little leagues. Uh, Milwaukee has the Beckham Stapleton Little League, which is one of the 
the oldest uh, inner city, uh, primarily black youth little leagues in the country. And it was founded by a former Negro League baseball player, James Beckham. Um, so the grassroots level, I think, is somewhere that this scholarship could head. Well, that's all I got. I know that was a lot, but I'm condensing a 135 page thesis into a, a short presentation. So I can take questions now. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ken, for, I mean, just uh, uh, really just uh, thorough, entertaining, educational, you know, you covered all the bases. Thank you. I hit, all, hit it out of the park. You hit it out of the park. No, that was, yeah. uh, that, you know, it's interesting because the title has to do with the untold story of black baseball in Milwaukee. And I think for a lot of people, this is the first time they're hearing about this, which is, you know, why we have these these opportunities to learn these things. Right. Um, so first, uh, we did have a question. If anybody does have any other questions, please put those in the comments now. We'll get to a couple right now. Um, Carolyn did put up a, a very long <laughs> question. Uh, basically, like Borchard Field was, can, do you know any of the history of that not to do with the Negro Leagues or with black baseball? Uh, well, I know Borchard Field was, I couldn't tell you the exact year it was built, but I know it was the primary sports venue in Milwaukee until County Stadium was built in 1953. So they had everything there. I mean, baseball was played there. Football was played there. Um, they held other venue, other events there, um, concerts, things like that. I mean, that was Milwaukee's main venue. Um I think the the Packers may have even played there, if I'm not mistaken. They might have played a couple games there. Um, and then it was replaced. When County Stadium was built, Borchard Field was pretty quickly uh, torn down, I'm pretty sure. So I have one question um, that, like, when we think about black baseball in Milwaukee, you talked about the Milwaukee Bears, and the Brewers do the Milwaukee Bears almost annually now. Like right. they, ha they have a game where they dress up in those uniforms, which is great. And you're, you're bringing about like this other side of black baseball in Milwaukee. Um, do you think that, um, first off, have you tried to contact anybody at the Brewers to be like, you're only telling half of the story. Um, and second is, you know, as far as the, the larger institutions are the uh, McCoy Nolan Giants represented at the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Yeah, you know, so I guess that's kind of a two-part question, right? Well, and I would I would argue the Brewers, and I give them a lot of credit for what they do to honor the Negro Leagues, but I wouldn't even necessarily say they're telling half a story because a lot of what they do with the Bears is there's not a lot of detail. It's this was a team that played here. They don't talk about who played there, right? Um, and that was one of the things that piqued my interest to start this project. Um, but yeah, there, in general, there is a privileging of the Negro leagues over the non-affiliated black teams when, you know, this country was full of independent teams and this goes for white baseball too. I mean, we privileged the, the major leagues over the independent, you know, semi-pro teams. Um, but our, you could argue that the McCoy Nolan Giants are a far more successful story <laughs> than the Milwaukee Bears are. I mean, I had never heard of the McCoy Nolan Giants before I picked up, um, uh, I think it's Bob Weggie's book on Borchard Field. And he just had one little like throwaway paragraph about them. And I was like, who are the McCoy Nolan Giants? And then I started digging. Um, and I didn't, I did not expect to find them having these levels of success. I mean, they won tournaments in California where all the top semi-pro teams in the country go to play and they won, you know, they went to Cuba <laughs> and played against the top teams in Cuba. Um, and they were based out of Milwaukee, right? I can't hear you, John. Uh, that's awesome to bring that research to light and uh, to have you here tonight. It's just great. So, uh, Ken Bartel, uh, thank you so much for yeah. uh, uh, talking about baseball and uh, black baseball in Milwaukee. Um, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, coming up on the 19th of August uh, with Je author or Jennifer Billock is uh, the classic restaurants of Milwaukee. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that. Any and all other info will be on our Facebook page or at MilwaukeeHistory.net. But uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you all soon and uh, take care, everybody. Take it easy. Thank you.